Welcome to the Court Sale Podcast. I'm your host, Annabelle Herman. Da, 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 Podcast. Thanks, Annabelle. I think I've got it from here. Hey, everyone. It's Matt Heyman, host of Coach the Sale. Episode 23 here. It's been a little while. Things have been pretty crazy, and it's been a little while since we've put a podcast episode out. I, like many of you, are working from home, hence the intro from my daughter, Annabelle, and what an incredibly crazy, strange time we live in at the moment. I hope that you, your colleagues, your family, your friends, your loved ones are all safe and well, and that you're looking after yourselves in what I can only describe as just the most insane, crazy times that we live in at the moment. And yeah, with that in mind, wanted to bring another episode to you, one that I recorded before the outbreak took place, uh, because I think it's time to really just try and give people something else to focus on besides the the terrible news that we keep hearing day in, day out. So I hope you're well, stay well, stay safe, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to Coach the Sale, the podcast for sales professionals on the path to becoming sales leaders. Each week, we sit down with sales coaches, successful sales leaders, and others at the top of their game to share what they've learned and help you to coach the sale. So to kick off episode 23, I'm speaking with Robert Cockerell. Now, Robert is one of the regional sales coaches at a company called SAP Concur, part of the SAP brand that many of you will know. Now, for a while, I've thought it would be great if we could get a coach working within a sales team onto the podcast to share their experiences of what it's like to be a full-time coach within an organization, helping staff develop, support them, and help them become better salespeople. And that's what Rob and I discuss on the episode today. We start off naturally by discussing what the sales function at SAP Concur looks like. We talk about the size of the sales function and the sorts of experience of the individual sales reps within his team. We dive deep into what sales coaching looks like, what Rob is doing on a day-to-day basis. He gives examples of how coaching has moved the needle within the sales team at Concur and some of the kind of results that people get within the organization. We discuss what a typical one-to-one sales coaching session looks like and group coaching. We also discuss some of the books that have had a particular impact on Rob and his work. And we finish with the advice that Rob would give somebody just starting out delivering coaching as part of a wider sales role, some of the challenges and how Rob would suggest those are overcome. Wherever you are, stay safe. Best wishes. Let's get to it with Rob Cuckerell. Rob, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm pleased that you said yes to this. I'm pleased that you uh, you reached out to me on LinkedIn and we were able to get this in the diary. I'm really looking forward to it. One of the things I've always wanted to do with the podcast is speak to people like you who are coaching teams within a business. You're in their day-to-day working with sales reps. So I'm really, really pleased you're on the show. Why don't we just kick off in the usual way? Give us a bit of an introduction about you, the company that you work for. Yeah, give us all a bit of an introduction into, into Rob and your story. Yeah, my story is uh, yeah, I, I originally grew up in, in the suburbs of Boston um, and uh, uh, ended up uh, you know, going to college. I uh, had a great college experience down at uh, UCF, uh, University of Central Florida. So I um, went down there knowing nobody and, and really had a great time in school. And then um, after college, uh, you, you know, fished there in the late 90s and Took a, took a few years off, didn't want to go to work right away, but ended up becoming an actor and a model and uh, did that for about four years and then um, got into sales uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and so I got about, you know, close to 20 years sales experience. Uh, I've been a rep, been a manager, been a director, been a VP. And the uh, uh, latter part of my career now is, you know, to be a little bit of service and to kind of give back and to kind of share my Trials, tribulations, successes, and failures with uh, you know newer MDRs, newer sales reps, uh, just to kind of help them uh, you know have the best chances at, at a successful career in sales. Fantastic! I think if, if I'd have chosen the the ideal guest to have on the show, it would be someone with a background like yours. I mean, maybe not the model and actor bit, but maybe <laughs> everything else. I think you're you're an absolute perfect fit, and I know people are going to love what you've got to share as well. So let's get straight to it. Then tell us a bit about Concur, part of SAP. I understand. Tell us a little bit about the company that you work for, and perhaps a little bit of an elevator pitch, or maybe the problems that you solve over there at Concur. Yeah. So I, I, I you know, Concur was acquired by SAP 2016, and Concur is. Is a full service spend management solution. So invoice, expense, and travel. Most folks throughout the world uh, use us 
for our travel platform. Uh, it's just a very easy to use. It's a, it's a mobile solution where you could you know uh, have an app on your phone, take pictures of receipts when you go out on a, on a big business trip, and then kind of just have everything imported into an expense report. So literally, it's, it's already done for you by the time you get, get, get back home. Um, most people know us for that, but we really do um, a full service, you know, wonderful solution on uh, all things finance. So we deal with CFOs, controllers, finance leaders uh, on a day-to-day basis and help them just really save time, scale their business, give them visibility into their real-time spend, and and just really help them, uh, you know, do as as much with their with their finances as possible, and then put that back into the business to help them scale. So that's what Concur does. It's a fantastic company. So, so do you guys then have relationships with travel agents or flights? What like do you, do you guys can people book through Concur, book their travel arrangements through Concur, or is it more about sim- simplifying the the, res- the receipts, the invoicing? What what do people get when they use Concur? Yeah. So the the loaded answer is all of that. Um, we have uh, direct customers that can book travel through Concur, and then we also have what's you know an indirect uh, customer that would be, you know, an in-house uh, travel agent for a big company or a mid-sized company, and they're able to uh, you know use our solution that way as well. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about the sales team. What does the sales function look like at Concur? Give us a sense of the size, the level of experience. You give, just give us a sense of what the sales team looks like there. Yeah, so I'm I'm responsible for I'm one of two sales coaches here in North America. One's back in Seattle. I cover Minneapolis all the way over to the East Coast. Um, for market development, we do we this uh, same, the Minneapolis office here is our biggest hub at scale. There's roughly 120 plus MDRs here on the floor, and then there's also regional sales reps, marketing. And then client sales uh, representatives here in the office here in uh, in Minneapolis, which is the biggest kind of hub, biggest office of the Concur side of the business uh, in in the U.S. And you mentioned already that you're an in-house coach there. What does that look like day to day? What are you involved in when it comes to coaching? You're not from from our conversations previously. I understand that you don't necessarily hold a quota as such, but you are there to manage and support the existing sales function. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. I do support the floor. So uh, inbound reps, uh, all our all our uh, MDRs. You know, some folks call them SDRs, MDRs. All our reps uh, on the inbound side that that handle small business, uh, mid-market size businesses, and all the way up to national size accounts. I don't cover the enterprise side. So everything below the enterprise side. Now that's an interesting function given given the size of the business that you have an in-house team. Give us an example of maybe how coaching has moved the needle for the sales team at Concur. What kind of results, what kind of stats can you share with us to show that having that in-house function is really moving the needle for the business? Yeah. So I know on a day-to-day basis, I mean, we, we get in and I I'll coach, I'll do live on the fly coaching sessions where I'll listen into the floor's calls, walk around, try and help people in real time, like in middle, mid sentence, mid conversation to see if I can help, you know, help them get a win or help them close a meeting if, if they're on the newer side, if they're newer MDRs. Um, and then also all the way up to, you know, coaching reps that have been on the floor for, and been in seat for quite a few months. And, and really the goal here is to take, you know, you always have your top performers and then, you know, a few, you know, people at the bottom. And then the, the goal here really is just to, to help move the middle as far to the top as possible on a daily basis. So a lot of one-on-one uh, coaching sessions, private coach, coaching sessions, and uh, running trainings uh, for groups, getting them involved with actual regional sales reps, and uh, just trying to get everybody on the same page through collaboration. And are the guys that you're working there, the MDRs, are they are they typically new hires out of college, or what kind of ages are we talking about? What what's the sort of demographic like at the, uh, the within the MDRs? Yeah, so great question. Uh, MDRs here are literally can can range from right out of college. Uh, one of our best reps has literally just walked right right in off off of graduating here at the University of Minnesota, and he's actually. Number one in the stack rank because I don't even believe he's maybe a day older to 23 or 24. Um, he's at he's he's pacing right now at 200 percent to goal, and 
that's a that's a that's a great story for me because and, and actually for all of the leader, sales leadership here in the building and, and probably org wide, because it's eliminated and eradicated any possibility for excuses for any, any of the other reps. Um, so you, you're talking about a range from literally right out of school. Um, they could sign a, a DocuSign, an offer letter right out of school. And then we have reps uh, who are you know close to my age. I'm, I'm 42 going on 43 and we have reps that are in seat that are you know, just about my age or, or close to it. So one of the big things I think that often comes up in conversations with sales leaders is is that sales coaching itself, the sort of work you're doing day to day, it's very time consuming. It's nice if you've got some in-house function like you and your colleague there going out working with the teams. What do you say to the people though who think that coaching really isn't worth the effort if most of the team are performing okay? Like, would you agree with something like that? And if not, what, why wouldn't you? Yeah, you know, I say... It's always going to be worth the effort when I'm lucky enough sometimes to see results in coaching, whether it's a one-on-one session, um, whether it's a, a training. And, you know, I'll, I'll just say to my, my MDRs, I'll say, listen, you know, in, if it's in a group training, you know, one group training recently, I said, you know, listen, I know we've thrown a ton at you in the last four, six weeks, systems proficiencies, learning the CRM. Um, your LDAs, your your talk track, your you know your pitch, your your that first eight seconds of your open, the ask in the end. But I really, really want to challenge you, and I really invite you to just have a conversation with a person on a on a very human level. Try and actually not try and schedule a meeting with these people. Just try to have a really, really high impact conversation, one on one conversation with another human being. Forget they're a CFO. Forget they're a controller. To get there, or anything, and just talk to them like people, and just try and try and have a compelling conversation with them. And I think the rest, if you can find that, which is you know, that's when someone gets really good at their job. But I, I just invite the the newer folks to do that, so that they can just be themselves, so that authenticity resonates, and it and it's and it comes right through the phone because the BS detector. For people on the other end of the phone, they get they get tens and ten calls a day, maybe you know, fifty to hundred sales calls a week, and I want them to be able to say, you know what, I know you've gotten a hundred calls this week, and I get them too, and and they suck, but I'm the person you actually want to take the call from, and here's why, I'm I'm the one that called you out of the hundred this week, and I and I and this is the reason why. I really, really think you should talk to us for a few minutes and just have a quick conversation. Excellent. So let's move on then to to get a bit more granular. I want to delve a little bit deeper and and try and pick your brains on some of the specifics about what you guys do over there at Concur. Give us a sense of some of the more granular or tactical ideas that that you guys use when you're working with reps, be they new reps or experienced reps. Give us an idea of some of the tactics, some of the actions that you guys go through when you're coaching teams. Yeah, so we... We have some pretty big influences here. Some of it is a, is is fanatical prospecting. You know, a lot of Jeb Jeb Blunt's teachings. We're really big on Jeb here. So a lot of it would be a five step framework. The you know the anatomy of a phone call, the infrastructure of a call, so that you can get the muscle memory down to have an effective sales call and have it be um, duplicated over and over again. Something that's scalable and repeatable. So you know. How strong is your open? How strong is that first eight seconds? Like riding a bull, right? How, can you stay on that bull for eight seconds without getting hung up on? And then once, you know, some people don't have a problem with that. Some people don't have a problem with an open at all. And then a lot of it, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Chris Voss fan. Uh, and, you know, I, we, 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 so we'll teach the, the open, you know, sk- state your open, state your intention, differentiate, Give a because statement. Like the reason I'm calling is because, right? Because we've, we've, there's been studies that say we just actually using the word because actually increases your chances slightly, and people people actually listen to that. And then what is your ask when you come back in? You're open in the ask. I think are the most two important parts of the the the, the actual pitch or the, or the actual infrastructure of the conversation. And is it a compelling ask? Um, and then. You know, we use LDAs, so that's an alleged disrupt and ask. So you can feel that person, say, you know, about to kick you off that phone or kick you off the call. What is the disrupt? 
Hey, you know, I, and I teach my, I teach my, my MDRs to pick one good one because there's a lot of ones that you can use. And the one that I always used to fall back on in case I ever forgot was, you know, that's exactly why I'm calling you. You can hear somebody about to hang up on you. That's exactly why I'm calling you. So to know your LDA is to be comfortable with exchanging punctures, you know, so to speak on the phone with a prospect and just getting them to submit really. If you're able to just box your way through a call very, very respectfully and very tactfully or, or, or tactically, um, I think that's, you know, that's, that's what I teach. That's what we teach. We're big teachers of that. Uh, being interesting while keeping the prospect interested. And then I usually leverage the reasonable versus un- unreasonable, you know, pro- uh, proposition, which is, you know, Matt, you're, you're the prospect. Prospect, you seem like a very reasonable person. Would it be, un- you know, having said all we've, what we've said today and all the, the value that would resonate with your business, would it be unreasonable for us to, to talk today just for a few minutes about how we may be able to help you you know, save 80% of your time and help you maybe get into your 2021 growth strategy a couple quarters early uh, and help you, you know, be ahead of schedule so that when you do sit down with your board or your stakeholders, or your shareholders, that meeting has, is, 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 has zero anxiety or very close to zero anxiety for you because you're ahead of schedule. That's, that's the impact that we're trying to train here on, in, on the bigger picture side of things. Awesome. And in terms of the how, you mentioned that you do one-to-one coaching, you do group coaching. What would a typical one-to-one session look like? And the reason I ask is because people listening to this, they may be new to coaching or they may be experienced and looking for new ideas. Give me a sense of what a typical one-to-one coaching session with one of your MDRs might look like. I'm really interested in the specifics about how you actually get the most out of that person in that session. Yeah. So it'll all it'll all first start by listening to the calls by by the MDR and and bringing in maybe a win, a loss and then a call that I think what we call is that different kind of a no. So maybe a call that they didn't turn a meeting on or they didn't get the meeting on but it was just everything was executedly perfect or I'm sorry, executed perfectly where they were able to uncover pain, uncover information really, really have a good conversation, but maybe they just caught the person. Usually we, we catch people at, at the wrong time, right? So it's just, do we, can we live and in, in, to fight another day and get some meat on, on that conversation so we can um, schedule that as a, as a high value task? So maybe the next time we call them, if we do catch them at a right time, we're able to schedule that meeting. But in, in a typical one-on-one coaching session, I'll listen to the calls. I'll let them listen to their own calls you'll be surprised once they listen to their own calls and hear themselves, they can almost self-diagnose and self-re-engineer themselves. But then what I'll go in and do and say is right here, you had an open, you let it go right here. You had it, the, the, the person kind of gave you a little bit of, a, of an in kind of like hitting the hole in football. You know, you have, a, you could see a little window and you just kind of just, you just hit that hole at full speed and try and, you know, run up the field as far as you can kind of a thing. So really just trying to show them when they have that slight, you know, ever so slight crease in a call where someone's leaving that door open and they are showing interest to just pounce on that, provide a ton of value, um, ask a very, very compelling open-ended question. Like, you know, if we're able to save you, you know, if, if an invoice comes into your company, what does that look like? Or if we're able to save you 80% of your time or 80% of your finance team's time, you know, your whole staff if we're able to put 10 to 15 hours back under their calendar every week, what would that actually mean to you? And then we just shut up and stop and, and just have them, you know, a, a very good, loaded, compelling, open-ended question. Like, what would that mean to you? And then I try to just teach them, you know, passion and emotion, right? Um, passion and emo- get passionate with what you're saying, because we really can, can do a lot of really good things for, for the, the people that we talk to on the phone. And find an emotional connection with them and, 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 and do some emotional selling and try to find a, a common chord that, you know, when's the last time you took a vacation prospect? I mean, you deserve it. We know that at the end of the month, you're probably working 15, 20 hour days for that last week of the month, trying to close out the books. You know, do you, do you want to work like that? Do you want to work, work on your heels or do you, do you want to be running your business or do you want your business to be running you? And, and I think if, if we can get everybody to be comfortable enough to have those conversations, 
to really just have those really blunt conversations at, at a high level, very professionally with a high touch point. I really think that, you know, that's what, that's where we're doing the best for our MDRs to help them uh, right away. So they go back, back right onto the sales floor and, and, and schedule, you know, go from scheduling one to, you know, zero to two meetings a day and then go from four to five right away. Boom. Just like that. Love it. And you've also mentioned there the fact that you're listening to calls back. Do reps typically, when they first start the process, do they feel quite uneasy or does it does it vary? My the, the sort of the stereotype is that most people don't like listening back to their own calls. What what's been your experience listening back to calls with the rep in the room and giving them feedback? Yeah, no, it, most people don't, and it's just I think it's just one of those. Uh, idiosyncratic things in our in our head that we, we hear ourselves on a recording and we're like, oh, I sound terrible, right? It's just, it's awkward. So that there is that awkwardness, some worse with others, you know, some worse than others. But I think that when you do play a call back for someone, most of the time they're able to hear where they maybe could have went in with more impact or where they, they, basically, they basically just missed a spot where they, they had a clear open and they could have went in and really drove home a certain point or a certain certain area of the business that had value or just simply just should have just asked for the meeting and, and said, hey, you know, I have your email ad- address as, as such and such. Would it be, would, it, would you be against me, uh, you know, sending an invite over to you uh, this afternoon? Would, would you have a few minutes or, or tomorrow morning? That kind of a thing. And, and most of them, when they hear the calls, um, with a little bit of you know kind of direction from me it's it's a it's a right away kind of a thing it's that aha moment yeah it's it's funny isn't it how when when reps listen back to their calls they just intuitively or instinctively get a sense of where they probably could have done a bit better where maybe they get a little bit awkward and they go oh if, if only i'd said it you know they, they in, in a lot of cases they do know what they what they want to say what they should say but in the moment in the call they just get caught up and and lo- lose focus but it's funny isn't it how uh, how reps just intuitively do seem to know a lot of the time what is the right thing to say even if they don't say it in the moment 100% almost all of them can identify where they you know could have picked a spot better or where they could have pounced on the opportunity to drive home, you know, the actual ask and the tie down the meeting. I, almost all of them know exactly when they're hearing it. Uh, it's just, and then a lot of it comes back like, oh, dang, I should have said this. I should have said that. I knew I should, I knew I could have said this. And they, they, they know right away, which is, which is really helpful to us doing the coaching. Cause then it's, we just kind of, kind of highlight that. And then, and then put that into an action item and, and moving forward, uh, you know, something to work on for to get back on the phones and just to try and, you know, work on that aspect of, of their, uh, of their craft. So let's, let's pivot for a second and, and look at books. Uh, I know that you're a, you're a keen reader. I'm an avid reader of uh, all sorts of different business books, nonfiction books. Give us an idea. Have you got any ideas? You mentioned Chris Voss. Obviously I'm a huge fan of Chris Voss's work. I love never split the difference. It's probably my favorite business book of all time. Give us a sense of some of the books that have had an impact on you uh, and what type of an impact they've had. You know, uh, Chris is right at the top of my list. Um, and, and this is the reason why he, I think we have, a, we have a lot in common aside from he's the lead FBI hostage negotiation you know, instructor. Other than that, I mean, I don't know how to do that. And I, 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 wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't feel comfortable with pitching, pitching somebody with, you know, as if their life depended on it. I, I really think that that would give me more anxiety that I could deal with. But, um, you know, he's a blue collar guy. I'm a blue collar kid. And I really appreciate the fact that Chris is, is really like a non-academic type of, of, a, of a cat, right? He's, he was an old SWAT team cop, uh, you know, in New York City. The FBI negotiation team walked into the Harvard School of Negotiation and just really just mopped the floor with them, which was kind of interesting. I, I found that fascinating because they removed logic from negotiation, which all the all the acad- you know, the, the, these high academic people were using logic, where Chris wasn't able to use logic when he was dealing with, you know, very dangerous and very bad people on the phone, where he couldn't really make those mistakes. Um, so um, I, I follow the Black Swan Group. I'm a, I, I'm a, I follow, I, I, I ingest as much of Chris's content via YouTube and watch his videos and watch his seminars. Um, he runs the company with his wife and his son, which I think is really, really. Uh, respectable and commendable. Mm-hmm. I, I really like. Um, I really like Jeb. I've. I really lean back on. Um, I, I've, re- I've read a phenomenal book 
call it's one of Grant Cardone's old books called Sell or Be Sold, which was a phenomenal read. And then I also lean back on my education a lot. I, I still have my psychology books. Um, I have there's two courses in school that that really kind of really I, I found fascinating. And I was a psychology major and then switched to communication. The only course I liked in, in high school was psychology. So I, I stuck with that and, and all the way through college. Uh, but there was a class called uh, Communication and Human Relations and then Personality Theory. So I, I lean back group dynamics for, you know, kind of working in a group and how to kind of leverage uh, the paradigm of, of personalities, whether it's introvert, extrovert, uh, you know, analytic, pragmatic. I really still use all that stuff. And I really think it's really transferable to my day to day and helping people scale and, and, and get really good on the phone and just good at their job and help continue to get myself better. But um, yeah, so I mean, a combination of, of those folks and kind of leaning back on my old <laughs> my old college tech textbooks are still uh, of value to me, which I don't think a lot of people could probably still say, which is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I think one of the things that that brings together so many of the people I've spoken to on the podcast. And one of the reasons why I enjoyed doing the podcast so much is that they all share a curiosity. They haven't kind of reached a peak and gone, right, that's me. I'm, I'm done. I've done it now. Now I'm just going to go and continue to do what I do. There's that constant curiosity, that willingness to learn. And I think that's really, if I could s- sort of simplify the essence of most of the guests I've had on the show, it would be that they do have a continual curiosity and then they just apply that to the work that they do, which just happens to be sales. But ultimately, they're very curious characters. 100%. And, and curiosity, you know, storytelling. This is, this is, this is, these are huge preachings from us now. We, we, in, we invite everyone to be as curious as possible, to really, really kind of think about, you know, the day in the life of, right? Like, it's almost like you're, I invite all of my new reps. I invite some of my peers sometimes who who ask me questions about, you know, how they would approach, you know, coaching a certain person that that really has a lot of talent, but is just kind of maybe just um, just taking a couple steps back for whatever reason. And it's really to just almost, you know, try and try and ingest as much information on your audience, and and, pre- and try and find content or information that'll allow you to almost to do to to walk the shoes like a day in the life of so we deal we 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 sell to finance leaders so it's you know i I challenge all of my folks to you know really kind of find that any information on the day in the life of a cfo the day in the life of a controller of a a mid market size company or or a large size company you know they're doing really really you know high numbers and high volumes um, that could really benefit from subtle tweaks and loops to their process. It could really turn into five, six, seven figures very quickly. And I invite them to really kind of almost watch documentaries or watch video or watch or just ingest information on how, what their day-to-day looks like so that they could speak their language and, and really just kind of understand, you know, what, what's going on and really to who they're speaking to and, and to kind of mimic them and mirror them in any way um, to help give them the best chances at, um, not only just selling to these people, but to just really have really, really good conversation with them. And I think the biggest thing too is the unsell, right? So we spend so much time just, you know, hitting our head against the wall, trying to close people. Sometimes we just, we go into, we come in too hot, right? We're coming in too hot, too much, too much salesy stuff, too much pitch, too much wording, just too much, just talking too much. I think a lot of times we need to shut up and we need to really unsell the prospect. We need to just kind of ask them questions about, you know, what does this mean to you? What would it look like to you? What is, what is your day-to-day like? What is, what do you do? That kind of a thing. And then take a step back to where they, if you can kind of get them to talk about themselves, which, which most people will do, um, if you ask asking the right questions, then you're, you're really just talking into another human being on the phone. And then it, you, you, you kind of come back to that place in the conversation where if you really at the really um, the essence or that that hallmark of the conversation to where you say, "What were we talking about again? Were you were you actually going to pitch me something?" And that's really the that's the the, the real sweet sweet kind of nectar of the gods part of the conversation that we all try to attain to get to. I love that, and I tell you another thing that I think is useful that links into what you've said is 
is for for SDRs or for anybody working in sales is is to listen to podcasts that are geared towards their target audience. So in the example you've given, podcasts that are geared towards uh, CFOs, ones that involve interviews with CFOs, gives you a real sense of some of the language, especially if you're quite new to a sector, give you a good sense of the language that they use and often some of the challenges that they face. And I guess events as well, although it's not as efficient, just going to events where CFOs in that example would be gives you that opportunity to understand some of the challenges that they face and the language they use so that you don't feel like an outsider when you're talking to these people. Exactly. And and, and the great thing is, is too, is, you know, I open it up to, I open my, I, I, I put sales calls or sub, uh, or demos from, from the actual regional sales reps on calendar. And, and a lot of them are friends of mine and that have moved up from the MDR role and, and, and they allow uh, you know the MDRs to come in and shadow a sales call, like a true web demo where they're sharing a screen and all that. And it's funny, you know, they, there's so much there's so much potency in that to give to an MDR. Mm-hmm. And one of the there's really good stories <laughs> that that I took away from um, how sometimes businesses are running at a dangerous a dangerous type of a business model, or they're just um, they're, they're just not, they're really kind of working with a broken process until we meet them and we're able to just kind of get everything at an optimal level. Um, there was a story that when we were in a, sitting in on a web demo where there was a company and they had multiple locations within, you know, one major metropolis, one major city here in the U.S. And they're, they're, they're just think about the, you know, we're in this paperless we are moving this, these paperless autom- you know, automation. We're moving, saving these people tons of time and just literally getting them to remove, you know, if they have to do a resp- expense report to just to eradicate all that downtime of processing paper and all that stuff. And th- there was this one company that had somebody driving around on a motorcycle with paper checks, company checks, <laughs> invoices, and receipts in a duffel bag going from location to location with hard copy, personal information, proprietary information, finance, financial information, and, and actual currency in a duffel bag. <laughs> like this is like some bad, like, uh, like, like, I don't know, uh, Dwayne Johnson movie or something. I don't know that, that we would watch like on <laughs> at the end of the month on Netflix or something. And it's just like, you really, it's it's amazing until you have these conversations. Some of the time that when you do talk talk to prospects, how how actually bad they need you, um, and they need your services. So it's just it's 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 incredible. And it's good for the for the different levels within the organization to ex- be exposed to those conversations, so that they can learn that not all prospects are just waiting for a paperless system. That in some cases they're dealing with very antiquated models, very out of date systems. It's it's, and that only comes from sharing that information across the organization, those demos, sharing those demos across teams. It's brilliant. Sounds awesome. Yep. So we're running short on time, Rob. I'm just curious. Do you have any examples? You've shared a few already, but do you have any other examples of times when coaching that either you, you've you developed or delivered or, or colleagues have delivered that's had a really clear impact on a particular individual? I'm always looking for nice stories, good stories about how coaching has impacted on individuals. Do you have any examples that you can share? Yeah, I have, I have, I have a few fairly recent ones here because I, I was prepared for that one, so <laughs> I wanted to give you some good ones. So yeah, I, I, I would say we had a, a, a new training class come on uh, probably end of the year, Q four of, of last year. Really, really sharp group, and I had just done a one on one session with with one of my MDRs. And just really trying to get him sharp on LDAs, so the ledge disrupt ask. He didn't have a problem with going in very directly, stating his intention for the call. His open was nice and clean and direct, um, and he was able to build value. But when he and this was at the very beginning stages, we're talking the first three four weeks, he was in seat, and you know the LDAs were just rattling him or objections in general, right? So someone would object, and he would just get thrown off course, right, and get a little bit of vertigo. And I just sat in the room and we, we just went over some strategies and really just, just this to me and the best analogy that I use for, for LDAs or objections is, is this is like verbal MMA. This is boxing. This is prize fighting, but you're just doing it on the phone, you know, with your vernacular, with your words. And I just got them really comfortable. I said, you know, this isn't personal. This is business. These people don't know you. 
the LDA is it's most by way most por- most parts reflex, but it's really not a big deal. The worst thing they say is no, and, and I just want you to get the muscle memory down to where you could just come back and counter punch. So if they punch, you counter punch, you know, and you go on with the the analogy there. And and he was able to take that, and it resonated immediately. And later on that week, he was on the phone with somebody. He was on the phone with the prospect, and the prospect and him had a standoff. And I think the call was a good twelve. 15 minutes. That's a long, long um, prospecting call from the, from an M, in the MDR world. Um, it usually means it's either a really good call and you're really building value and you're setting up a, a, a sales executive with a phenomenal, phenomenal um, meeting that should go flawlessly, right? Um, but he was literally just trading blows with, with this gentleman and, and he was saying, no, I don't have time. No, I don't have time. And we went over the time um, rebuttal and, and LDAs. And, and then he went back and he just, he just sat in and he, and finally he said, call me, the, the prospect said to my rep, he said, call me back in six months. And he just sat in there and exchanged blows and until he submitted and he, and he, and he turned the call from, I don't have time. Call me back in six months to getting the call on calendar that same day. And, and there, there isn't, that is, that is the, the golden standard. That is like the, the pink unicorn or the golden unicorn uh, of, of coaching is when you can get somebody it's, and it's probably happened maybe five to 10 times a year where you can turn someone from a six month um, LDA or objection and, and to, to get them to flip back to this, to a same day, you know, meeting to get on calendar, which is pretty phenomenal. I love that. You've, you've said you've got a couple of other examples. So give us one more. Yeah. So another one recently, um, I had a rep come in and she, she had been a part of a finance team. So she had literally been a finance leader. So she came right in with a lot of great industry experience from the other side, from the, from, from the financial world. And she had just kind of lost track. She just kind of had veered off course. Her, her confidence was low a little bit. And we went in and we just did real intense one-on-one session we really just ripped away like right down to the foundation everything the talk track the open the the value the the because statement the ask we went in and then we went in and we we really practiced ldas but then i really went back and i said i actually really think that you're, you're very coachable but i really think that the only issue here is it just would be muscle memory and repetition and that would fix the confidence problem. But I, I really want to challenge you right now to really find you in this whole situation. I want, to, I want you to actually really do some real self-reflection. What would you actually say to this? What would you actually say to, to let's say, a family member of yours or a friend of yours? How, what would be the actual verbiage, the vernacular, the, the tone, the pace? How, would you, how fast would you talk to somebody that you knew real well? what would that sound like? And then we kind of, I listened and I said, see, it sounds completely different. So we went back in, we changed the pace, we changed her tone, we changed all of, you know, we, we tweaked the verbiage around and her, her, her pitch and her talk track and all that good stuff. And then in the end, she walked out of that session, she got on the phone and in her first call, she scheduled a meeting. And I, I don't think she had in about a week. She was just really just kind of um, just kind of had lost a little, little bit of her morale, not too bad, but she had just kind of lost that gusto. And she went back right on the phone and she scheduled a meeting on that very first call. And I just found that to be completely rewarding. Oh, kudos to you. Thank you. Kudos to the rep. I mean, that is, that's so, so good to hear. And it's, and it's not uncommon as well to have somebody who, like you alluded to right at the top of the interview, sort of o- over try on this professional sounding sales call that, Sounds like every other sales call that happens, but when you just lower that and just speak as a person to another person, it makes so much difference. And it's great to hear that in that example, it turned out really well. Yeah, it was great. It was it was it was, it was a good win for for everyone, and I and I I hope to continue to have more like that. Awesome. So we're running up on time, Rob. Um, just one last question for you before we head away. What advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out delivering coaching as part of their wider role? So maybe they're not necessarily a dedicated internal coach, but they're somebody managing a team. They want to get involved with coaching, but they're a little bit new to it, a little bit green. What advice would you give to somebody just starting out? Yeah, and I the, the greatest advice I would give to an, someone starting out in coaching would be that there is 
there is a, a slight difference between coaching and, and, and managing. It's, it's, it's a different, it, it, it's different. So I would, my biggest piece of advice would be to, it's the, 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 the acronym we use here is, is KISS. It's keep it stupid simple. So when you're, when you're coaching someone for the first time, it's like, take them out for sushi. Don't take them to the all you can eat buffet, right? So you, you want to give them one bite at a time pieces of critical information and really kind of do a hard stop at, you know, a, a very small amount of, 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 you know, something that's going to take up that their bandwidth and then just build upon that. Um, you, know, you, you use one small building block of good coaching, what you, what you think is the most critical to that particular rep um, and start with that. And then just slowly, but surely, you know, um, just add, add as you go. And, and as, as their, their bandwidth increases and they get and, and, and the whole game to them slows down a little bit and they were able to process more information, uh, give them just more as, as they can kind of ingest and take on as they go. Because in the beginning, they're going to be quite all over the place and, 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 and inundated and, and just completely overwhelmed. So I, my, my bi- biggest bit of advice would be to keep it stupid simple. Thanks for listening to another episode of Coach the Sale. For show notes, sales coaching resources, and more, visit refract.ai slash coach. <laughs>